All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for the September operator meeting. My name is Tyler Vallon, and I will be your host for today. Um, as a reminder, we will be addressing questions at the end of all presentations, but of course, um, you may enter those into the chat as they come to you. Um, and just a couple things before we get started. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our new executive assistant, Sienna Madursky. Sienna, if you want to say hi. Hello, all. She'll be taking over these meetings moving forward. Um, so starting next month, she will be the host. And also I'd like to note that we did change the Zoom credentials for this meeting. It was a one-time change, um, but they've been updated in our website, um, the monthly email from Constant Contact, as well as the Google Doc agenda um, and our internal calendar. So if you have those credentials from the operator meetings prior to this one, you can go ahead and delete or unsave those because we will no longer be using them. All right, and let's go ahead and get started with the first topic on our agenda. Uh, we have a Form 7 monthly report of operations update from Chris Eisinger. Thank you, Tyler, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Tyler, if it's okay, I'm gonna replace your shared screen with, with mine. So I assume everyone can see the, the slide here. What I wanted to uh, share with, with everyone is our uh, plans to update the Form 7, the monthly report of operations. Um, we are going to be migrating this uh, to our newer electronic forms platform uh, in the coming uh, weeks. And um, this is something we've been uh, uh, had on our uh, uh, priority list to do for a while now. Um, we need to make some changes to the data templates that uh, operators use to provide the information that will help remove redundancies, um, improve the clarity of the reporting. Um, and um, we're also uh, wanting to uh, align our processes with recommendations from the state auditor uh, that were made with uh, regards to improving production reporting. Uh, finally, there is a, a new uh, data reporting requirement for um, uh, operations associated with deep geothermal. And so we'll be adding a um, section for reporting that to this new Form 7. Um, this will be happening uh, soon in the, in the coming weeks. Um, we will be providing uh, these new data templates uh, for operators to see and, and examine uh, sometime in the coming weeks here um, in September. Um, after we do that, a few weeks later, we will have the Forum 7 available uh, for reporting. We anticipate that your October production, which is due 45 days after the end of the month would be, and actually that would be, um, uh, it should be September production, which would be new, due by November 15th. So I'll update that, um, that you'll be using the new form seven to report that. So uh, we will keep you updated. Uh, we will make an announcement when the new data templates are available. Once they are available, we ask that you, uh, download them and, and take a look um, in order so that you can prepare uh, to submit the information using them when the new form is available. Um, if you should have any questions or concerns, especially once the templates are available, um, you can reach out to our production staff, uh, Corey, uh, Essex, and Terry Ikenoy. Um, so that's it. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Up next on our agenda, we have the Produced Water Data Reporting Forms 7, 7W, and 47 from Greg Duranlo. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Tyler, I'm going to do the same thing and bump you off to share my screen. No problem. And if you could just confirm that I am, in fact, sharing a presentation. Yes, we can see your screen. <laughs> Great. Um, so thanks, everyone. We are, as most of you know, we're about a year into um, the produced water reporting uh, required by House Bill 23-1242. Uh, 
and now um, enshrined in statute 3460-134. So that's in the Oil and Gas Act. Um, section two is the well reporting uh, rules. And section three is the um, oil and gas location reporting rules. And I'm not going to sort of read through those. I'm mostly memorializing those statutory requirements here in this presentation um, for all to reference. These will, um, these reporting requirements will be incorporated into the produced water rulemaking that is, um, a, a straw dog was released um, beginning of last week for, for comments. So if you haven't seen those, there's a link on our homepage. Um, and um, we are accepting comments through the end of this week so that we can get those noticed to the Secretary of State to meet the statutory deadline for rulemaking um, December 31st, uh, 2024. Um, so just wanted to update folks on the reporting progress. As I said, we're a year into reporting um, by well. Um, so the Form 7, following on, on Chris's um, presentation about the, or announcement about the Form 7, um, so the Form 7 is for reporting oil, gas, and produced water, um, including disposed water. The Form 7W was added um, to accommodate uh, the monthly reporting uh, by well as required by statute. And then the Form 47 was created um, independently um, to accommodate the quarterly reporting by location. So our team, um, Terry and Corey, have, have reviewed the data that we've received over sort of the first year of, of reporting on the Form 7W, looked at the um, reports that we've received, um, and we're making some, some progress. So um, from January to June of, of 2024, um, over 200 operators reported production on the Form 7. 120 operators reported water on the Form 7W, and 70 operators reported water on the Form 47. So we are making progress. We've got a lot of operators reporting on the 7, 7W and, and 47, but we do see that there's a deficiency there that um, there are likely some operators who uh, have not reported on the 7W and Form 47 who probably should have. Um, so we are making progress, but we have a long way to go. Uh, we want operators to be successful in this reporting. Um, so we want to make sure that if you have questions about reporting, if you don't understand whether or not the reporting applies to you, um, please reach out to our team. Um, any of these folks can answer various questions and we've given these contacts out before. Um, if it's, you know, questions about, hey, how is this, um, how should I report in this situation? Or do I need to report for this situation? Or how do I use this form? Uh, Terry and Corey are probably your best um, experts there. Um, maybe if it's an apl applicability question, does this form apply to my operations? Um, that might be a good question to, to reach out to me with. And uh, it's if it's a question that, hey, this form is not working, I'm unable to submit data even though I've followed all the instructions, um, Chris Eisinger is probably your best contact for that. Um, so that's all I've got. Again, we've got some deficiencies in the reporting in the Form 7W and Form 47, and so we want you all to be successful with that. So um, if you're doing it and you maybe think some of your colleague operators are not, uh, tell your friends, they need to report. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Well, next on our agenda, we have the 2024 Commission Hearing Schedule and Implementation of SB 24185, Protections for Unleased Mineral Owners in Pooling um, from Elias Thomas. Thanks, Tyler. Good morning, everybody. Elias Thomas, Hearings Manager here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well. Okay. Does that look okay? Yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm here to just give a brief presentation, number one, on the remaining hearing schedule for 2024, namely commission regularly scheduled hearings. Um, as you know, 
there's a rulemaking going on as we speak and we have two more scheduled for the rest of this year. So I wanted to give everybody a sense of when we'll have regular hearing schedules, where there's still some gray areas and when we will not have schedules. Um, after that, just a brief discussion on portions of SB 24185 that went into effect uh, as of early August. Um, apologies for the delay on daylighting this. Uh, obviously, it's been very busy for us. So I will go through and, and welcome any questions. First up, we'll talk about the hearing schedule. As you know, cumulative impacts and enhanced systems and practices rulemaking is ongoing. Uh, at least through September 20th, it may run into the following week if necessary. Um, carbon capture and storage is scheduled for November 12th to 15th and produced water rulemaking is scheduled for December 11th to 18th. With those dates, which are of course subject to some adjustment, um, the remaining regularly scheduled hearing dates for the commission are below um, September 25th and 26th. Obviously that could be impacted should the CI rulemaking run long. Um, we will provide updates on that. Uh, on the record at the rulemaking, as well as on the website, if anything changes. Um, a full month of hearings, regularly scheduled hearings in October, except for October 2nd, which has been canceled, um, and hearings on November 6th and 20th, uh, no hearing the week of Thanksgiving, and then we have one scheduled for December 4th. Uh, all of those will also entail consent agenda um, and there can also be consent agendas scheduled for dates during the rulemakings. Um, so that's what I've noted uh, there. Potential additional dates remains to be seen. Um, we have in the past, as with geothermal, worked the rulemaking around a regularly scheduled hearing. Um, if we need to do that, and if we can do that based on the, the heft of the rulemaking, the number of parties, et cetera, uh, we can consider it. Uh, that would be subject to uh, to approval by the commission, of course, but that is the outlook for the remainder of the year. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always contact me to discuss uh, that schedule. Moving on to SB 24185, protections for unleased mineral interest owners and in pooling. Um, what I'm discussing today is the portions of this statute that have gone into effect as of early August. I will be back in likely December to discuss the portions that go into effect on January 1st, 2025. So this is part one of the presentation, and this is what staff and hearings are looking for moving forward. Um, as of right now, we've only received a few pooling applications and they are being worked uh, subject to the new provisions in SB 24185. So I'll just briefly go through the big three that we're looking for moving forward in pooling applications. Um, the first one, all pooling applications must include an affidavit that declares the applicant has requisite ownership or obtained requisite consent, and you have to in include certain well and leasing information. Um, I've just laid out what the statute says uh, almost exactly. This is what we want to see with the affidavit. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and read it, but obviously a lease, memorandum, et cetera, API number, and then disclosure if you're relying on an unrecorded lease memorandum or lease or conveyance. Um, failure to submit this is uh, would deem the application incomplete. This is now a requisite part of the pooling application. So that would be sent back by our permitting staff uh, for amendments. Um, moving forward, if a petition is filed in the matter um, or an applicant is relying on an unrecorded lease, we might need that to, uh, we, might, we will need in additional information to be uh, disclosed. As you saw in the previous slide, if you're relying on an unrecorded lease, you have to make mention of that. Or you can work with us if you are trying to redact um, certain information or not provide certain information subject to Rule 223, confidential confidentiality. Uh, we'll work with you on that. Um, and the statute specifically provides for that. There is still uh, a requirement to work within the confines of confidentiality if needed be. But if a petition's filed uh, and the applicant's relying on an unrecorded lease, at the very least, this following information is going to need to be disclosed. Um, it's very possible that the, uh, this, the unrecorded lease might need to be disclosed. 
Um, so that's kind of what we're working on here. Obviously, every situation is different, um, but this is the bare minimum that would be needed to see in a petitioned pooling application. Moving on, um, at least 60 days before the first hearing date for which the commission has provided notice, um, an unleased mineral owner can file a protest of the application. Uh, as you may know, this is slightly different from our usual notice schedule. Normally, the petition deadline is 30 days before the noticed hearing date. So moving forward, all pooling applications will be noticed for hearing on a 90-day time frame, with the petition deadline falling 60 days before the hearing. We believe this complies with the statute, having the petition deadline fall 60 days beforehand. Um, while still giving that 30-day period for the applicants or the mineral owners, excuse me, to review the information they were sent along with the notice of hearing. Um, we also don't believe that this is that much of a change given that Rule 506 does require all pooling applications to be filed 90 days before the hearing anyway. Um, it's just in those cases where pooling applications needed amendments, uh, we were able to notice them for 60 days uh, later on in the process. We're no longer going to do that. All pooling applications will be noticed for 90 days um, once deemed uh, permits will be noticed. And just some additional context, I kind of discussed this on the last slide. To resolve a petition that uh, stems from this, um, it's gotta be done before the hearing. We think adding that extra 30 days to comply with the statute will also promote resolution of petitions before the noticed hearing dates. 30 days, as, as many operators know, if they've dealt with a petition pooling application, uh, is not a lot of time to get things ready for, uh, to get things resolved or to get things ready for a petitioned hearing. Um, and we're gonna do so in a process that protects the interest of the unleased mineral owner that's articulated a factual dispute here. Uh, as I said before, the previous slide, requires certain disclosures. Uh, we believe that um, is also going to assist in, in the process. Um, it will give the unleased mineral owner more information um, and hopefully uh, help resolution uh, progress. And then finally, again, I discussed this in the last slide. Uh, it would allow the unleased mineral owner to review in a manner that protects conf confidential information any unrecorded materials used to support the affidavit. So as I said before, this is kind of where there's a bare minimum that would need to be disclosed in this situation. Um, possibly the unrecorded materials will need to be disclosed. Finally, um, new protections regarding local governments that own mineral interests within a unit and those local government's mineral interests fall within their geographic boundaries. Um, the statute's pretty self-explanatory. If, if the local government rejects the offer to lease, they can't be pulled. Um, so what we would like to see in applications moving forward is just clearly identifying if this is a potential issue. Um, obviously, that's subject to change. We often see testimony come in uh, later on in the process that shows that some unleased mineral owners have been, uh, are no longer unleased and that's fine. Uh, but we would like to see at the outset in the application clearly identified uh, any local governments that are unleased mineral owners within the local government's geographic boundaries. Uh, and we'd like to see that as a standalone paragraph in the application and also listed and denoted in the interested parties list. This will very much as, uh, assist staff and hearings to uh, to prep for this being a potential issue uh, moving forward. Um, so in summary, we're really just looking for the new additions to the application, which are the affidavit and proof of mineral ownership in the unit and uh, clearly identifying the local governments that are unleased uh, within those geographic boundaries and within the unit in the application and then identified clearly in the interested parties list. And moving forward, all pooling applications will be noticed for 90 days um, without exception. And that is really all I have for now. Uh, I understand that this is going on at the same time as rulemaking. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to try and answer some now. You can also reach out to me uh, personally, and I'm happy to discuss uh, these with you further.
And that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. Um, we'll go ahead and move into the Q&A portion. Um, Chris, I believe this first one is for you. Does the new Form 7 change reporting requirement or just how we report it? Thanks for the question. Uh, it will just change essentially how to report it. There is not any anticipation of, of adding additional reporting requirements. In fact, we're going to be reducing some of the um, columns on the form that were redundant. So um, right now there is no plan for additional reporting. Like I did say though, there is going to be an additional section or tab um, for the geothermal reporting. So if you were to be reporting the required information on geothermal, uh, a geothermal well, then that would be additional, but nothing is gonna be different on the standard uh, report of operations. Thank you, Chris. Um, Elias, this next one is for you. Uh, if an applicant is not pooling any unleased owners, will the 90 day pooling timing still apply? Thank you for that. Uh, yes. Um, what we're trying to avoid here is tiers of different notice periods and petition periods. And so we think, especially given that Rule 505 requires the applications to be filed 90 days before hearing anyway, that all pooling applications moving forward will be noticed for 90 days just for consistency and, and clarity purposes. Thank you, Elias. We'll leave the chat open for a few more moments for any questions that trickle in. Um, but in the meantime, here is the schedule for the upcoming operator meetings for the rest of 2024. And excuse my typo, this is supposed to be 2025. January, February, March, April. Uh, and if you'd like to be added to the operator email list, go ahead and shoot me an email at tyler.bowen at state.co.us. And if anyone needs any immediate access to these presentations today, you can also shoot me an email and I'll send that directly over to you. And it doesn't look like we have any more questions to address. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, we hope to see you at our next operator meeting in October. Take care, everyone. This meeting is adjourned.